In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Heavenly King, Consoler, Spirit of Truth, you who are everywhere present and fill all things, treasury of all that is good, master of life, come, dwell within us, cleanse us from all steam, and save our souls, O good one. Mary, cause of our joy, pray for us. One of these times I may um, explain or talk about that prayer. It's a prayer from the Byzantine rite, which is used to start just about everything. Um, but we have a lot to do today, and um, I just pray that we're going to get it all done. I want to begin a conversation, though I'll continue it, on the power of the word, which is a thing that is completely lost on us. First, because of our Kantian heritage. You see, words are arbitrary, and... Um, they're imposed by us on the reality. That is, knowing is me dominating reality, whereas knowing is really me receiving reality, which gives itself as a gift. Uh, and I express that gift in a word. And that word gives to that reality a different existence. Is that okay? You guys get that? Okay. Let me make another step then, you see. Uh, so human words are the reality existing in another mode of existence. And that's wonderful alchemy by which that happens is what we mean by cognition. We have a false idea of cognition and therefore we have a false idea of God's word. You see? See, God, when he speaks, gives to his intention an objective existence. We receive the objective existence and reword it. Is that okay? All right? Then let's move on. I'll come back to that. Because, you see, the power of the word is really the power of the reality mediated by the word. The words are words. But there's so many places where scripture and tradition talk about the power of the word that we have to realize that if we will pray and, and come to a, an experiential understanding of the word, then when we speak it, we're speaking about the reality, not the words. And people's hearts are touched and moved. And people are healed. As I'm going to read in a moment, a text from Aquinas. So the power of the word. God said, let there be light, and there was light. That's that. Now, I can't say, let there be light, and there was light. But I can say, that's light. I can absorb that reality and give it an existence in my world. Now, when that reality is communicated to me prophetically, then... It's the very word of God, the very living reality of God that I'm mediating. And that's um, prophecy. Not everybody who disturbs people is, is a prophet. You know? um, I used to tell my students, you know, a lot of people get on a bus and tell everybody they have to repent and do all that. Are they prophets? Probably not. This is how you can tell a prophet. He loves God's people. She loves God's people. So her prophecy, or his prophecy, comes, you see, with fire, earnestness, intention, but purity of heart. It doesn't condemn. But it's a power. Look at the power of Dorothy Day's words. Or Catherine Dorothy. Or so many others. It's a power. Now we have this text. It ends the second section of uh, the beginning, starts to end the second section of Isaiah. For just as from the heavens the rain and the snow come down and do not return till they have watered the earth, making it fertile and, and fruitful, giving seed to him who sows and bread to him who eats, so shall my word be. 
that goes forth from my mouth, it shall not return to me void, but shall do my will, achieve in the end for which I sent it. My word. My intention given expression. Um, other texts where you have the same notion. In their distress they cried to the Lord who saved them in their peril. He sent forth the word to heal them. His intention to heal, be healed. That same power of God's word you see in Jesus. Lord, if you will, you can heal me. I do will, be healed. It's a power. And that power can be given. It is given. I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son. This is my body. This is my blood. There's power there because it's sacramental. And that's very important, you see. Augustine has this wonderful phrase, Acceded verbum ad elementum et fit sacramentum. When the word comes to the element, the bread, the wine, the water, the married, a couple of you married, and the sacrament happens, et fit sacramentum, because the word comes to the element. That word is the gospel, not just the formula. It's all that is behind that formula. The God, I baptize you in the name, means what? I plunge you into the death of Christ. That's what's behind that word. And that's why it is effective. Okay? In their distress, they cried to the Lord who saved them in their peril, sent forth the word to heal them, snatch them from the grave. He sent forth his word and it healed them. He hurls down hail like crumbs. Who can stand before his cold? He sends out his word and melts them. And so forth. His expressed intention. There are many in the New Testament. <coughs> and I want to touch on a few. Because <coughs> in the long run, it's going to uh, uh, affect the way we look at our preaching. I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. Jew first, then Greek. That's Romans 1.16. <clears throat> and so you see the, the gospel. The gospel is not um, the words. It's the reality mediated by the words. Suppose you root for Oh, I don't know, the Green Bay Packers. <clears throat> and I come in and I say, the Packers won. That's good news if they won. It's the reality of the winning that's the good news. So when I say, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died and rose to free us from sin and to bring us to eternal life, that's good news. Because it happened. It's true. And my words mediate that truth. There are so many others for our gospel did not come to you in word alone but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with much conviction. And for this reason we give thanks to God and that was 1 Thessalonians. This is 1 Thessalonians as well. They give thanks to God unceasingly that in receiving the word of God from hearing us you received it not as a human word but as it truly is the word of God now at work in you. The Word of God is at work in you. And this is another one. The Word of the Cross is foolishness. That expression of the reality of the Cross is, is, is foolishness to those who are perishing. But for us who are being saved, it is the power of God. That expression, you see, of the Cross is the Word of God and its power. It's the power of God, this Word of God. Many have had this experience, I have had it myself, of preaching and having people healed by doing the sermon. Mostly of deafness, which is sort of God's audio-visual aid. Uh, he's saying, my word is powerful, my friend. Take it in, it will change you. Our Lord said to his disciples, you are all clean because of the word I spoke to you. Um, 
I'm not going to go on with much more of the epistemology of the word, but you can see that our whole notion of what a word is, it's an arbitrary sign placed on our categorizing reality. It is not. It is a sign, you see, of what we have received from reality. I, I think I have here somewhere a beautiful quote um, from uh, somebody about this, well, what Maritain calls the basic generosity of existence. Things are, and because they are, they are in act. Um, okay. Uh, I want to read a couple of texts and then we'll be ready to move on. I'm going to have to come back to this, of course, but I want to give us some kind of confidence that if we pray, if we spend time with the text, then the text takes root in us, and then when we preach, it's the reality borne by the text that touches hearts. And it's what changes people. All right, this is a, a text now about uh, Sacra Doctrina, holy teaching. is food and drink. This is Aquinas. Because it nourishes and satisfies the soul. The other sciences, whatever they are, philosophy, mathematics, whatever, history, the other sciences only enlighten the mind. This one, however, enlightens the soul. This is a characteristic of the teaching of sacred scripture, that in it, not only speculative things <clears throat> are handed on, but also those that are to be practiced through activity. I want to give you one more text um, in the time that I have left. He's talking about the Ephesians and the uh, Word of God. In the third verse, place that are weapons for attacking. <clears throat> but not only must one defend oneself, but it is also necessary to attack the enemy. Just as in bodily warfare this is accomplished by the sword, so it is accomplished spiritually by the word of God, the sword of the Spirit, which you must take up, which is the text he's commenting on in Ephesians 6.13. As it says in Hebrews, the word of God is living and active. Then he concludes, Thus we have weapons for fighting the demons themselves, namely the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. This happens, listen to this now, this happens frequently in sermons in which the word of God, penetrating the hearts of sinners, drives out the tangled mass of sins and demons. That's what's supposed to happen when we preach. It's the power of God, not our power. But it comes from the realities mediated by the words. Um, one more text and we're, we'll be done. Um, indeed, the liturgical celebration becomes a continuing, complete, and effective presentation of God's Word. The Word of God, constantly proclaimed in the liturgy, is always a living and effective Word through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, they say always. Always, if we're preparing and if we're living a life that's in conformity to the will of God. All right, now we're going to stop thinking about that now and move on to the second section.